So thanks, Julia, very much, and thank you uh, for having me. Uh, thank you to all of you for all I've learnt in, uh, on the theme of this conference. And I'll be trying to refer to a number of the different talks I've gone through. As Julia says, this theme uh, of ethics has been very much uh, there. So I'm an um, ethicist and a theologian. My title is Ethics for an Age of Metabesity. General question, what's the significance of ethics uh, for, for thinking about efforts to slow or prevents progression towards disease uh, and uh, infirmity. Um, we say he lived to a ripe old age, don't we? Uh, the goodness of life and uh, healthier, longer lives is a staple of wisdom across many cultures. Uh, long life is a kind of sign of blessedness. And perhaps such a view barely needs to be articulated here since it forms the basis of the vocation for many uh, researchers, uh, clinicians and others. Uh, in short, work to target metabesity would seem to be simply a, a straightforward uh, a good. But perhaps things aren't quite as simple as this. For example, very many difficulties which attend uh, later life which might make us qualify a too easy insistence on longer life and indeed healthy ageing as being a, a straightforward good. Or again, there may be improper factors which bear on motivation, such as what one colleague of mine has called leucopathy, leucopathy an exploitative desire for money which may, indeed I emphasise may, attend the healthcare profession and medical industry. Uh, to use an older term, and we're talking about filthy lucre. So how do we get a handle on uh, ethical questions around uh, metabesity? Um, in communications prior to this uh, gathering, uh, Zan commented that metabolic rootedness is the tie that binds all metabesity targets together. While metabolism is but only one factor in any metabesity condition, it serves a focus to bring all of us out of our silos. And I think that a focus on the theme of responsibility or obligation has a similar capacity to draw conversations out of silos and into common inquiry. So what I'll say now is about uh, the responsibilities of individual patients and would-be non-patients, uh, researchers and clinicians, uh, governments and uh, policy makers. Uh, so I'll address that under, under those three broad headings. And then I'll share a final thought about uh, responsibility and uh, compassion, which is appropriate to uh, today. So starting then with thinking about uh, a central thread in an age of metabesity, which concerns personal civic uh, responsibility. What health obligations, if any, does a citizen owe to other citizens? The type in blue is my ways of making connections to some of the other presentations uh, we've had. Uh, consider the following uh, argument. One, uh, emerging science can now confidently, confidently tell us what pharmacology, nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, socialisation and so on can do to improve healthy ageing. Uh, point two, the avoidable loss of health is bad not only for oneself but also for one's neighbours who have to bear its financial and increasingly its emotional burdens. And point three, at least some ignorance about and unwillingness to act on information about one's own healthy ageing constitutes a failure to keep obligations to one's neighbours. So this is a somewhat bold argument at present and may seem a little uh, unbalanced. We should bear in mind what we learnt from Philip Holm yesterday, a realism about the complexities around motivation regarding uh, weight loss, um, realism about the feedback mechanisms which um, are in, uh, involved in um, uh, uh, weight loss. Um, but we should also ask about what obligations the mass of citizens have to individuals, not only to inform about, but also to, also to encourage a more disciplined and healthier uh, life. We were hearing uh, from Gillian just before the break about uh, shared decision-making, and also from uh, Stephanie about um, coaching and therapy and the role of artificial intelligence in uh, that kind of supportive uh, environment. But we might want to go beyond this. Maybe it's even right to uh, go beyond encouragement to, in fact, in some way, uh, coerce such a life of disciplined health through the threat of sanctions. Uh, such, qu such questions, of course, quickly raise uh, kind of anti-paternalist uh, hackles. So this is the kind of space we're in. Uh, there's an old line from the story of Cain and Abel, uh, which goes, am I my brother's keeper? Which we might gloss as, 
Are we our meta-obese neighbours, keepers? That is, do we have a responsibility to know about what will promote our neighbours' health and to act accordingly? For example, to know the social determinants of one's neighbour's health, the context in which they live and suffer ill health uh, and die. Uh, think especially yesterday what we heard from Lucy Rose uh, in terms of um, uh, loneliness. So are we our meta-obese neighbours keepers? We might also call this, no, uh, we might also gloss um, no taxation without representation as no taxation without healthcare obligations. That is, if we are taxed to cover your bad choices, then we have a duty to tell you clearly what your obligations are and you have a duty to comply. Uh, think of anything from laws requiring most cyclists to wear helmets to obligations on pregnant mothers uh, not to risk the ill health of their infants uh, in utero, smoking, drugs and hazardous activity and, and so on. Again, that's the kind of space we're in. So human nature has come up uh, in various ways in the course of our discussions. I mean, human nature is anything from uh, licentious to uh, judgmental and sometimes both at the same time in the form of uh, hypocrisy. And uh, this raises uh, a further issue. How will a culture respond when someone fails to meet their obligations? Cultures vary, anything perhaps from uh, moral laxity to moral rigor, one might suppose. The point I'm trying to make is that in the form of a characteristic response, you might discover something about societal character. And I'll return to this later when I uh, talk about uh, uh, compassion. So that's the first um, go at uh, thinking about responsibility, personal civic responsibilities, how they interrelate. And the second is to think about the responsibility of, especially of, cl of clinicians, researchers, and others in the sort of broad policy area around metabesity. And I think there are three I want to mention here. The first is to consider the impact of tackling metabesity on what, what we've just been talking about, on citizens' sense of personal uh, responsibility. I'm grateful to uh, one of our conveners, uh, Thomas, for the, uh, the, the following thought experiment. Uh, what if um, science allowed us to invent an exercise pill? Taking a couple of pills would work in respect to someone's metabolism so that, so that their body received the equivalent of a daily uh, 10K run and an eight Tabata cycles of ultra high intensity interval training. Be a pretty good pill, right? Uh, I went for a run on Sunday in order to avoid sounding like, sound like a hypocrite today. That's my uh, confession to you. So oh, what, are, what are some downsides uh, to such a pill? Well, what if this pill enabled those so inclined to rest content as couch potatoes? Uh, Jill Leng referred to the uh, RCT in relation to, um, uh, in, in the last session about better exercise, but then uh, diet went uh, down. And that's a further kind of iteration of this kind of uh, uh, problem of human psychology. So that's one kind of problem which might go um, wrong with an exercise pill. But what if, what if um, such a pill actually enabled people with caring responsibilities for elderly parents to make up for the exercise they have, have an opportunity to undertake? This would seem like an upside to such a pill. If the health outcomes were equivalent to actually taking exercise, should scientists or clinicians be concerned about creating couch potatoes? Would this entail a paternalism about what's important in human life? We didn't mean you to give up on personal responsibility for health, uh, for, your, for your nutrition, for your sleep, for your stress management, for your socialization, uh, etc. Um, Alternatively, if a pill enabled governments incrementally to withdraw from providing care for the elderly, since the young could do it and stay healthy, though without leisure time or exercise, would that be a good or a bad thing? So this thought experiment opens up the kind of questions which might follow from effective um, uh, drugs to deal with uh, uh, problems around exercise. So even if this um, drug um, is never devised or made available, the general question is, how those targeting metabesity shape the ecology around personal responsibility uh, for health. A second responsibility of researchers and clinicians um, would be to take action to prepare for the consequences of success. We've already been touching on this in the last uh, couple of sessions today. Put the question like this, what qualities will we need in our political societies in order to benefit from and care for people living relatively long periods of relatively well life before decline uh, and death. 
What kind of political identity should we aspire to in order to achieve this? What societal practices and beliefs that honour old age should we advocate? What approaches to citizenship will inspire, in the words of one theologian, a love of those living uh, later life? And this seems important because success, I take it, will likely normally involve marginal gains in the scientific clinical policy uh, agenda. While there may be great steps forward, gains will often be incremental. And of course, reverses may be just uh, as common. And this means that while significant progress may be made in slowing or preventing decline, there is a foreseeable challenge of civic participation, especially for the frail elderly, whose decline has been slowed and who live longer, but in increasingly difficult uh, circumstances. Um, so uh, Eric Verdun uh, was talking about the difference between the rate of increase in lifespan versus the rate of increase in, in health span uh, yesterday, and that's the, the data behind uh, the concern. So incremental gains at one stage may accentuate suffering at another stage uh, of life. In short, there will continue to be those who in some way fall out of successful healthy life extension treatment into what some people have called a kind of fourth age, the third age being healthy, older life, fourth age being um, uh, a, a, a steep decline. And perhaps on average, people will be older than they would have been and with perhaps greater needs. And I think Jill Leng was referring to that kind of area in the last session. Uh, and as she referred to, there is a, a significant variation in the funding models in relation to social care. It's one of the great challenges in this country as to how we, how we tackle that. So that's um, how you prepare for the consequences of success, the kind of political, social questions that we'll need to be thinking about, and no doubt are already in lots of different ways. And some of those will be local, some of those will be national, international. Uh, and the third point would be taking action to galvanise public debate about intergenerational justice. So think about the cohorts of older citizens who benefited from better education, acted on advice on nutrition, exercise, sustained mental faculties, and energy for longer. Of course, then they want to be active in pursuing uh, lifelong activities, continuing to occupy roles and jobs for longer. And this may bring significant benefits. Institutional memory, wisdom may be preserved, innovated on. Uh, contributions to the world of work, civil society, family life may continue to enrich the lives of older and younger uh, generations. But long life is not simply all blessing for all concerned. Long life is a qualified good. It has costs. Um, so my own university, Oxford, uh, has voted to retain a compulsory retirement age, principally on the basis of inter intergenerational justice, of stopping the intellectually active elderly from hogging the lecture halls, professorial chairs, and publication opportunities. So make of that what you will. I imagine there are different policies in different places. Uh, we're unusual in the UK in having such a policy. Um, to develop the example given earlier, uh, longer uh, lifespans, as distinct from health spans, may simply extend the time when younger people, let's say those in their 60s and 70s, are unable to retire unencumbered. Uh, why? Because they're caring for their parents through their 90s into their 100s, but with increasing needs. So what should be the focus of our ethical inquiry here? Uh, the quality of uh, loving relationships between multiple generations, the quality and availability of meaningful work and social roles for the healthy aged, the quality and quantity of time to enjoy rest from caring responsibilities. In short, what qualities should mark a ripe old age? And these are all questions which are posed by success and which I take it clinicians and researchers are obliged either to address or at least to highlight as those partly responsible for success and best able to foresee its consequences. The third set of responsibilities. There are responsibilities on government and policymakers to take measures to encourage right choices which are available uh, to citizens. So such responsibilities um, on, on, under government uh, would first include uh, questions of intergenerational justice, acting where appropriate in this fraught area, also taking action on um, uh, uh, environmental factors. We heard from Ashok yesterday about uh, car fumes and um, uh, uh, aldehydes and tumour suppression, surprising results, and the, the public health implications uh, working out from, from there. 
But there are other kinds of more immediate questions of responsibility which relate to the choice architecture in which citizens uh, lead their lives. It's controversial territory. Uh, Richard uh, Thaler, the grandfather of nudge theory, uh, received a Nobel Prize in economics recently, as you probably saw. But there are those who had ethical concerns about the concealed nature of persuasion, even manipulation in, uh, uh, judge, in, in choice architecture and behavioral insights. For some people, this comes back to a worry about an illiberal paternalism. And this brings us full circle back to questions of uh, public participation and consent. Should we, should you be satisfied with clinicians and researchers saying, this is just the clinical advice I'm giving to you about your health, you decide what to do. Uh, this is just a drug we've um, developed which will help reduce your risk of X, Y, or Z. You decide whether to take it or carry on taking it. Or should we expect a much more energetic medical government, government and policy uh, direction towards informing, encouraging, nudging people to make and abide by choices which are by some agreed standard right? So in this country, uh, nanny state is the great libertarian battle cry at this point. Uh, there are various levers that Simon Stevens, the chief executive of the NHS, can pull, downsizing the chocolate bars available in NHS properties and so on. Um, and these measures are far from nothing. But far more difficult is the kind of culture change in society to take responsibility both for tackling metabesity and preparing uh, for success. And such culture change requires some convictions about a shared civic life, which can change behaviour in ways that choice architects can't reach. Uh, Philip Horne uh, mentioned yesterday in a specific context how culture change is tricky and slow, um, and that's uh, perhaps an understatement. So coming towards an end now, um, I've talked about responsibilities of the general public, of researchers and clinicians, of government and policymakers. Lastly then, a question and a comment about societal character and judgmentalism and a thought on compassion. It seems to me that the rather vague word compassion gains definition from thinking about metabesity and responsibility. Uh, we're thinking about the heart of a political culture that one desires and promotes. So what's the risk here? The risk is an implicit or explicit judgmentalism which lights upon irresponsible or in the British term feckless behaviour, singling out a subpopulation as a kind of irresponsible health underclass a less than respect to a group of people, uh, if you like, a sea anchor in, in society's increasingly stormy healthcare environment. It was the Greek philosopher Aristotle who said that compassion is less appropriate to people the more responsible they are for their bad condition, what Jill Lang referred to in the last session, those who brought it on themselves. In a society whose chief, chief goal is health preservation and disease prevention through some kind of mutual obligation, such thoughts will have some traction uh, over time. So what vision of human value and human responsibility for metabesity will shape uh, compassion in an age of metabesity? Probably many visions generating uh, many varieties of compassion. The UK will probably muddle along without any great vision, as we normally do. We're quite pragmatic in that sense over here. But that doesn't mean there can't be some kind of cultural preservative to accompany a preventive approach to disease and decline. My reflection is that um, uh, moral or religious traditions, such as Christianity, which interweave responsibility with compassion, understood specifically as mercy, uh, have much to offer in healthcare. You may not know this, but today is the 500th anniversary to the day of the Protestant Reformation. Happy Reformation Day. Um, and so it seems very appropriate to say a word uh, on mercy. Uh, mercy implies a recognition of uh, responsibility for failings in some agent or other, in individuals, organisations, governments, and so on, but also the possibility of moving beyond failings in the assurance of continued companionship. Such a vision affirms both preventive medicine as a deeply moral endeavour and permits discretion as to the manner and timing of a focus on personal responsibility. Overall, it's the quality of companionship throughout the human life course, and as Christians believe beyond it, which is the defining mark of a compassionate community defined uh, by mercy. October 31st, 1517, 500 years ago uh, today. So, some take-home questions. Are we our meta-obese 
a neighbour's keepers, also known as no taxation without healthcare obligations. How will we love both later life and younger generations? What qualities should mark a ripe old age? And what political culture of compassion and responsibility will we pursue? Thank you very much for your attention. And there are some various uh, open, app, open access publications available on the group which I lead, the Healthcare Vet Values Partnership, uh, available for you, uh, which uh, takes some of these questions into more detail. But I look forward to our conversation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.